Hello, my name is Doug Sparks. I'm the president of M2M Technologies, and uh, we're, a, we're a consulting firm that specializes in the semiconductor, MEMS, and sensor industries. Today, I'm going to talk about the trends towards re regionalization for MEMS and semiconductors and their supply chains. A little bit about the semiconductor supply chain and the components. Uh, basically, the MEMS and semiconductor supply chains are 99% the same. They all involve wafer fabs, the factories that the devices and uh, substrates are made. Uh, the, the fab equipment, there's chemicals, wafers, masks, software. Of course, people, they need education and fab experience. They need know-how, which generates IP patents intellectual property. And of course, funding is critical. And as you, as you probably know, fabs are being built everywhere around the world. They're expensive. There's a lot of infrastructure going on. Fab equipment recently has been in short supply. We can't keep up with the demand for fab equipment. Now, a MEMS product is typically made of three major components. The MEMS chip, a silicon or silicon and glass chip with the movable device. The CMOS IC, also known as an ASIC for application specific IC. And then the package. For consumer devices, this is usually a plastic package, very small. Then don't forget testing because the final package part has to be calibrated to the types of motion or sensor stimulation needed for the sensor product. And MEMS packages, sensor packages, comes in a wide variety depending on the application. Industrial devices can be very expensive, often wrapped in stainless steel. Aerospace devices are small but expensive because they're usually used ceramic or metal packages for long life reliability. There are medical devices that can be implanted in a patient. They can be wearable devices. They can be worn like a ring or a smartwatch used for an intravenous solution. Uh, monitoring. Automotive devices are also a reliable, high reliability environment, maybe not quite as long a lifetime as an aerospace chip, and they have to be less expensive than aerospace. Consumer devices are the smallest, highest volume package that there are. These have to fit into those rings or smart watches, so they have to be tiny, low cost, and they're made in the hundreds of millions of units per year by different companies. Now, packaging is the first area that the, the uh, semiconductor industry exported into the Asian market. So back in the 1960s and 70s, Japan, South Korea, Singapore started doing semiconductor packaging. I know when I worked at uh, Delphi early in my career, we had a large packaging facility in Singapore for pressure sensors, MEMS pressure sensors. We also had IC modules being assembled there. And this continues today. The majority of the packaging or OSAD activity is done in Asia. That includes uh, South Korea, China, Malaysia, um, Philippines, etc. CMOS wafer fabs. Those also have come to reside primarily in Asia. The bulk of CMOS wafer foundries, particularly at the high-end nodes, are in Asia. This insert on the right kind of shows you the leading edge fabs, TSMC, 54% of the market, followed by Samsung, UMC, Global Foundries, and SMIC. Now, there's been a lot of expansion of CMOS wafer fabs in the last few years as a result of the supply chain problems. Most of this expansion has been at the smaller nodes. Uh, in, the, in North America and Europe and Japan, these nodes have been three nanometers, maybe to 17 nanometers. In China, they've been around 22 to 28 nanometers. Now, most MEMS products currently use 45 nanometers or larger. So there's overlap with automotive and IoT applications, which results in a short supply of capacity for MEMS products in the CMOS foundries. Future MEMS products are going to need to use 300 millimeter wafers and nodes below 28 nanometers to take advantage of this new capacity and wafer fab, wafer fabs that have been built around the world. Of course, other regions besides Asia have uh, ASIC CMOS 
boundaries, uh, the North America, Europe. This is a, a quick map of Europe. Uh, some of the interesting things there are that companies like um, ST Micro and Bosch, who are the biggest players in the MEMS market, also have CMOS foundries there. Intel just announced that it was going to build a new sub five nanometer uh, wafer foundry in Germany. So you're going to see some growth there. Uh, TSMC declined to build a new fab in the EU, but TSMC, Intel, and Samsung are all building new five nanometer node fabs in North America. A big trend that we're seeing with all CMOS fabs is that the lead times have increased dramatically. Um, you're going to have to wait several months, almost 30 weeks, to get a CMOS wafer lot out now. It used to be around 12 to 15 weeks for a new CMOS wafer lot. So that's a new trend, longer, longer lead times for CMOS wafers. And this kind of shows you how the MEMS foundries are distributed across Asia. Uh, Hanking Electronics is in Shenyang. That's the foundry, the fab that I've been working with for almost 10 years now. Again, Silex is there, SMIC is there. Japan has quite a few MEMS fabs. Sony is the biggest. They produce a lot of microphones. TSMC and UMC are also there. And then in Singapore, we have uh, a Vanguard and, and developments um, at ASTAR. Solterra is the big aluminum nitride CMOS MEMS foundry in Malaysia. 200 millimeter wafers are the norm. These fabs are key for fabless MEMS products uh, users. This just kind of shows you worldwide distribution for MEMS foundries. And in Europe, we have ST Micro and Bosch. Those are the two biggest. XFab is a big foundry for MEMS. They have some great device development groups, Letty and uh, IMEC. In the United States and Canada, Teledyne Dalsa is the biggest foundry followed by Atomica, which used to be called IMT. Uh, Japan has both MEMS sensors, OSATs, and foundries. Silicon sensing for gyros and other foundries. Sony, the big uh, uh, microphone foundry. It has some really unique uh, wafer, I guess I call them wafer fabs, the stainless steel fab in Nagano for high pressure, uh, high pressure sensors for automotive industrial applications. Instead of using silicon, they use a steel substrate, kind of a unique uh, technology. There's also a lot of government support in Japan. Six, $6.8 billion are going to be used to improve the semiconductor supply chain. Uh, they did announce that TSMC is working with Sony and Denso to build a new uh, CMOS imaging sensor that will also be able to do 12 nanometer FinFETs. That'll be ready in 2024. And then you've got a, a number of sensor companies like TDK, Murata, um, Denso, ROM, that are our headquarters in Japan and sell a lot of sensors all around the world. South Korea, we always think of Samsung, we think of South Korea and certainly Samsung CMOS foundry, it's number two in the world in capacity. Samsung did exit the MEMS business uh, about a decade ago. Uh, Amcor and ASC are the OSATs, the packaging companies that are headquartered and staffed in, uh, in South Korea. And we're seeing the Korean government committing to 47 billion US dollars over the next several years to benefit over 150 Korean chip companies. So they've already got a pretty decent semiconductor supply chain, and they're going to spend a lot of government subsidy money to enhance that. Malaysia is an up and coming uh, a MEM supplier and CMOS semiconductor supplier. They've been an OSAT supplier for decades. They have 12% of the world's OSAT packaging capacity and a quite a large number of companies doing the packaging step for the semiconductor industry there. Silterra, which was originally a CMOS foundry, added an aluminum nitride piezoelectric module and is making a lot of piezo, you know, piezoelectric devices and device wafers. They also recently added the Akmetic CSOI, cavity SOI process for other types of MIMS devices. And then the big news in Malaysia was that Foxconn is going to build a CMOS foundry there. So they're going to have billions of dollars put into this new CMOS foundry in Malaysia. Singapore is the last country I'll talk about. Um, it's had a long history of government support for semiconductors. 
It has a really nice, ASTAR is a really nice R&D facility. They actually have an agreement with ST Micro to do uh, R&D on MEMS technology in Asia there. UMC is building a new 22 nanometer CMOS foundry there. It's $5 billion they're spending. Uh, Soytech has its Asian manufacturing facility for large diameter wafers to service the Asian area. So there's a lot of good infrastructure uh, in Singapore. Yes. Now, MIM, uh, China has quite a large number of wafer fabs across the country. This just kind of shows you example of where some of them are located, <clears throat> what wafer diameter, or maybe company owned them. About 40% of this is in the Shanghai area. And I've circled in red the different MIMS fabs that are in China. Uh, Hong Kong, where I worked at, are, is there. Um, Beijing has the uh, Silex facility. Uh, you also have some facilities in Wuxi and Suzhou, and Shanghai, SMIC is an example. And it's an interesting trend you see here in the left, bottom left, is that China has actually caught Europe and Japan in semiconductor market share last year. So the market share in China, all this investment is starting to pay off and they're, they're gradually increasing in market share worldwide for semiconductors. Now, what types of MIMS devices are made in China right now? They're typically made on 150 or 200 millimeter wafers. So the complete conversion to 200 millimeter wafers in China has not occurred, but there are several fabs. Hang King is one, Silex and SNCC are, are the other examples of 200 millimeter wafer fabs for MIMS. Uh, pressure sensors, accelerometers, gyroscopes, um, F-bars, microphones, of course, are all made in China. Microphone is the only truly high volume product at Vortec. And then there's also the quartz oscillators, uh, magnetic sensors, some infrared sensors that are kind of unique sensing devices that are made there. Again, only microphones are in high volume, so there's some need in, for investment to get to truly high volume needs that the Chinese market demand. So there's a lot of importing of MIMS products. Just a good example here is Applied Materials. That's the picture in the lower right. They have a, a, a really great facility in Xi'an, China, uh, and other companies also are represented uh, in China with, in, with internal support for China. But there's also a lot of new Chinese equipment companies. Uh, Amex has been around for a while doing plasma etching tools, not just in China, uh, but around the world, and their LAM is their competitor. Um, we have uh, Piotech in Shenyang doing uh, PECBD, King Semi in Shenyang to track uh, photo resist processing, uh, which is uh, in great need. And then we have some other companies like uh, uh, SMEE working on lithography tools, trying to catch up with ASML, and they're also doing bonding tools. However, you're seeing this trend towards regional supply chains. Sometimes it's called friend shoring, where you take uh, countries that have shared values and they form a supply chain together. For example, US, Japan, South Korea, EU. You might hear, hear near shoring, where you have countries that are close to each other, China, South Korea. Those are gonna be near shoring supply chains. So these regional multiple duplicate supply chains are gonna add infrastructure, labor costs, and it's going to lead to continued price inflation. So just in summary, uh, there is an ongoing trend from a global to multiple regional semiconductor supply chains. CMOS IC foundries have added new capacity, and they're going to continue to do that in the next three years, primarily in the three to seven nanometer nodes. Uh, in China, it's going to be 17 to 22 nanometer nodes. Um, MEMS products are going to have to transition from their old, larger nodes to these smaller ASIC nodes. That's going to be a new trend in the future. Virtually all high volume fabs are 200 millimeter, but some are going to 300. Cost and price inflation will continue in 2022 due to these supply chain issues and monetary expansion problems. Zero COVIDs are still complicating the supply chains, especially in China. And the good news is China can support a full MIMS supply chain, but it needs to invest more to get high volume uh, MIMS sensor supply chains going, high volume MIMS products. Thank you very much. If you have any other questions, contact me at this below email or visit my website. Thanks.